Dr. Abadi, let's start with the Iranian elections just a couple of weeks ago, uh, and then we'll go back in time to your book. What's your assessment of the role of the elections, and what does it tell us about contemporary Iran? Iran is a country that has been in the past two years, هیچ کنم از این انتخابات آزاد نیست برای اینکه صلاحیت کاندیداها بایستی به تایید شورای نگهبان برسه Every two years there are elections in Iran however these elections are not free uh, there is a vetting process where the competence of the candidates has to be approved by the Guardian Council در انتخابات پارلمان اخیر بیش از 40 درصد از صلاحیت کاندیداها رد شد و اصلاح طلبات توانستند یک تعداد کمی به پارلمان بفرستند. In the recent elections that we had 40% of the candidates were vetted out they did not pass and so a few number of the reformists were able to get elected and go into the parliaments. صرف نظر از اینکه این تعداد خیلی کمه بعد در رای گیری تأثیری نداره اساسا اگر تمام پارلمان هم می گرفتن باز هم تغییری در شرایط ایران نمیداد Regardless of the fact that their numbers are few and they're not going to bring change because they don't have that many votes but even if they were, they were the majority in the house and they did have votes they wouldn't be able to bring a lot of change in Iran اگر به خاطرتون باشه آقای خاتمی که لیدر اصلاح طلبای ایرانه هشت سال رئیس جمهور بود و در یک پریود زمانی پارلمان مجلس ششم اکثریت در دست اصلاح طلبا بود یعنی برای یه مدت چهار سال هم قوه مغننه و هم قوه مجریه در بس در اختیار اصلاح طلبا بود اما متاسفانه هیچ اتفاق نیفتاد و هیچ کاری نتوانستند انجام بدن so if you remember, Mr. Khatami, who was actually elected by the reformists, was the president of Iran for eight years. Also, during his presidency for a period of four years, the parliament, the majlis, was also um, uh, the majority of the reps were uh, uh, reformists. However, during that uh, time, when both the legislator and the executive were in the hands of the reformists, nothing much changed. علت این امر ساختار سیاسی ایرانه. طبق زیرا طبق قانون اساسی تمامی اختیارات در انحصار رهبر رهبر مادام الهم انتخاب میشه از طرف مردم هم انتخاب نشده بلکه انتخاب رهبر در ایران شبیه انتخاب پاپ توی واتیکان and the reason behind it is the structure of the government of Iran, the constitution of Iran, provides for the exclusive rights of the leader, and the leader is their lifetime, and he is not elected by the people, but he's um, appointed, and his election is sort of uh, like by the clergy or the appointment, something similar to the Pope's election. Yes. <laughs> پاپ اختیار سیاسی نداره ولی کن لیدر ما تمام اختیارات سیاسی و همچنین کلید بهشت و جهنم و هر دوتا رو با هم داره However the Pope does not have political power whereas our leader has a lot of political power and in addition to that he has the key to heaven and hell <laughs> But perhaps another similarity is the lack of women voting uh, for the Supreme Leader, or even participating in the elections? Iran is a country that has a majority of the children. Iran is a country where approximately 60% of the university students are women. Iran is a country that بیش از پنجاه سال زنان شق رای به دست آوردن حتی قبل از زنان سوئیس رفتن به پارلمان and in iran women gained the right to vote over 50 years ago they even were elected to the parliament prior to the women in switzerland بنابراین جنبش فمینیستی در ایران بسیار قویه و حکومت هر کاری که 
هر طوری که خواسته زنها رو سرکوب بکنه موفق نشده Therefore the feminist movement is very strong in Iran the government has tried hard to repress women but it hasn't happened با وجود تمام شایستگی های زن ایرانی و تازه در این دوره که فکر می کنید زن ها بیشتر به مدرس رفتن متاسفانه فقط 8 درصد نمایندگان زنن notwithstanding all the merits that Iranian women have and now that we think a lot of women have been elected to the parliament it's only 8% of the parliament that's occupied by women um, let me ask you one other contemporary question and then we'll move back a little bit with your book um, how do you think the Iran nuclear agreement with the United States and European countries does it provide a path forward for Iranian democracy and human rights? من با تحریم اقتصادی ایران مخالف بودم زیرا که این تحریم ها فقط باعث فقیر تر شدن مردم شد. I have always been against the economic sanctions against Iran because they resulted in uh, making the people poorer. تحریم اقتصادی هیچ وقت باعث سقوط رژیم و یا تغییر عملکرد رژیم نمیشه. نمونش کره شمالیه که این همه تحریم در موردش اعمال کردن هیچ چیز عوض نشد فقط مردم روز به روز گرسنه‌تر شدن. So uh, economic sanctions or sanctions against the government are not going to topple any government and uh, uh, they're not even going to change the behavior of governments. Uh, the best example of that would be North Korea. Uh, North Korea is still the same but the poor people have gotten poorer and poorer. Vamo dar morad in ke aya in tawafuq ba'is mi shavad ke ravish hukumat Iran avaz beshe باید بگم که نه چیزی عوض نمیشه برای اینکه بعد از این توافق رهبر آقای خامنه ای بارها اعلام کرده ما در سیاست داخلی و سیاست خارجی هیچ نوع تغییری نخواهیم داد so whether this agreement is going to result in any change in Iran I don't think so because the uh, leader of Iran has stated many times that nothing is going to change in the foreign policy or domestic policy of Iran به عنوان مثال طبق گزارش آقای احمد شهید گزارشگر ویژه حقوق بشر برای ایران در سال گذشته یعنی سال 2015 ایران حداقل هزار نفر رو اعدام کرده که برخی از این اعدام ها در خیابان بوده بعضی ها افراد زیر 18 سال بودند و این تعداد به نسبت سالهای قبل هم اضافه اضافه تر هم شده so pursuant to a report of Mr. Ahmad Shahid, who is the special rapporteur on Iran, uh, the uh, number of executions have actually yes. increased in Iran. And these, uh, we had approximately a thousand executions during 2015. Some of these people were under the age of 18 and some of the executions were done publicly. That's right. That's right. I'm going to move on to talk about the beginning of your beautiful book. You're a practicing Muslim. You begin your memoir with a quote from the Quran, and this is the quote, and the wrongdoers will soon know to what place of return they shall return. You're also fiercely proud of Iran, the nation, <clears throat> its people and its history. And you begin with a quote from Aeschylus, I know how men in exile feed on dreams. Can you talk about these choices of beginning your book? Hamuntori ke ishare kardid, man iftekhar mikonam ke musalmanam, iftekhar mikonam ke irani hastam, va az hamey in ha balatar iftekhar mikonam ke yek insanam. As you said, I'm proud of being a Muslim, I'm proud of being an Iranian, but most importantly, I'm proud of being a human being. Yes, and a dissident, and an activist. Man, elatin ke israr kard, yani ta'kid kardam ke insanam, yani nas ke be tamami hukuqi 
که یک انسان بایستی داشته باشه معتقدم و تمامی عمر به دنبال این حقوق بودم به همین دلیل مدافع حقوق بشرم Uh, the reason that I stated that I am a human being is that I believe that all human beings should have all human rights, and this is why I decided to defend human rights and dedicate all my life to it. So in the 1990s, after you were prevented from being a judge anymore because women could not be judges, you opened a children, women and children's, a children and women's human rights center in Iran. Why did you make that choice about children and women? در ابتدای انقلاب صحبت کردن از حقوق بشر مثل این بود که شما یه بم دستتون بگیرید برید تو خیابون خیلی خطرناک بود کسی اصلا جرأت نمی‌کرد صحبت از حقوق بشر بکنه At the beginning of the revolution talking about human rights was very dangerous It was like holding a, a bomb in your hand and going into public. No one dared talk about human rights. I remember that the government of that time, when they wanted to say to me, they said, go to the government, go to the government, go to the government. So when uh, the newspapers that were government-run newspapers wanted to insult me at that time, they would call me, oh, you feminist, oh, you a supporter of human rights. So that's, it's natural that at that time I couldn't uh, found an NGO regarding human rights. But then I decided uh, to pick the topic children's rights because the government of Iran had joined the uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child. Unlike the United States. <laughs> بله اصولا کشور شما با کنوانسیون های بین المللی به خیلی از کنوانسیون های بین المللی ملحق نشده و yes. این یک ایراد بزرگه Yes, I'm aware that your country has not uh, exceeded to many uh, of international conventions and I think this is a bad thing اما اجازه بدین که من این رو اضافه بکنم ملت که من حقوق کودک رو در تعیین کردم برای شروع فعالیت ها برای اینکه حقوق کودک همون حقوق بشره بچه هارم وقتی که ما میگیم تبعیض نباشه خب مسئله حقوق دختر بچه ها با پسر بچه ها هم مطرح میشه وقتی که ما با ازدواج دختر ازدواج زود رس مخالفت میکنیم به عنوان حقوق کودک این همین مسئله در حقوق بشر هم هست در حقیقت میتونم بگم من بزرگسال پشت سر بچه ها قایم شدم So you asked me why I decided to found the uh, Center for the Defense of Children because I believe that the, the rights of children are the same as the human rights I mean when we speak about the rights of the girl child when we speak about early marriages When we speak about all the rights that children have, it's actually the same as human rights because these are discriminatory laws. And the reality is that I kind of hid behind the rights of the child. That is true in the United States as well. <laughs> so children are the poorest Americans, for example, in the United States. <laughs> I think you guys need to start as well. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's stay for a minute more on the question of executions of children, because as you said, this past year, the Special Rapporteur has just released a report um, denouncing the escalation again of the use of the death penalty in Iran. 966 people, not ju children, to people in Iran were executed last year. And we in Illinois are able to feel a little good about the fact that we finally abolished the death penalty in Illinois <clears throat> after a long struggle, long struggle to abolish it. But we have abolished it here in our state. <laughs> عوض شد و قوانین خیلی بدی تصیب شد. 
After the 1979 revolution in Iran, many of our laws changed and many bad laws were passed. که به نظر من یکی از بدترین قوانین این بود که سن مسئولیت کیفری را آوردن پایین. مسئولیت کیفری سن مسئولیت کیفری برای دختر 9 سال و برای پسر 15 ساله. I think one of the worst laws that passed was the age of criminal responsibility that was reduced to 9 years for girls and 15 for boys. با این تعریف می‌بینید اولاً در یک سیستم حقوقی که زن ها حقوقشون خیلی کمتر از مرداست ولی کن 6 سال زودتر از مردا مسئولیت کیفرشون شروع میشه. So you will see that in a legal system where uh, women's criminal age is nine, however they don't have as much rights as men do, you see that their criminal age is basically six years behind men's criminal responsibility age. و در مرحله دوم میبینید که این سن انقدر پایینه که حتی حیرت آور مگه میشه که ما یک فکر کنیم یک دختر ده ساله همون عقل و درایت یک انسان چهل ساله رو داره. And secondly, when you think about it, it's really shocking because how is it that we think that a ten-year-old girl has the wisdom of a forty-year-old? بعد از تأسیس انجمن حمایت از حقوق کودکان و فعالیت‌های بسیاری که من و همکارانم کردیم در برخی از موارد محدود در مورد مسئولیت کیفری کودکان تغییراتی داده شد. However, after we founded the Center for the Defense of the Rights of the Child and the Mothers and uh, Women, we were able to bring a few changes in the laws. Uh, regarding children. So pursuant to our laws now, uh, for people who are under the age of 15, uh, the court can uh, come up with a lesser punishment. اما هنوز هم در مورد قتل حتی قتل غیر عمد حکم اعدام صادر میشه. But unfortunately regarding murder, even second degree murder, which is like unintentional murder, death penalty is, uh, is uh, prevailing. و این یکی از مواردی است که من مرتب گزارش میدم به یونیسف و راجبش اعتراض میکنیم اما متاسفانه هنوز از قانون حذف نشده. And this is one of the issues that I bring up in my reports to UNICEF and I write about it. Uh, however, unfortunately, the law has not been changed. I'm going to talk a little bit about the repression that you experienced in your last 20 years in Iran. You saw your name on a list of activists targeted for state assassination back in 1999 when going through some legal papers um, that she was working on. You spent three weeks in Avin prison. Do you say Avin? Avin prison in 2000. You were made constantly aware of intensive surveillance of you and your daughters and your family from then on. So I think that your steady defiance over the years uh, is remarkable be in this context. You worked with families of children who were going to be ex executed. You established a mine clearing collaboration association because Iran is the second country with the most landmines in the ground, live landmines in the ground from the Iran-Iraq war. You uh, had Kurdish music played at the Nobel ceremony uh, in your honor uh, when she received the Nobel Prize. Um, you used the money from the award to create the Defenders of Human Rights Center, uh, representing political prisoners and publishing monthly reports. And you used the Nobel money to support families of political prisoners uh, and to be a center for dissidents and victims. Given this remarkable work, 
can you describe a little bit of what you do so deeply in the book about the growing opposition of officials to the work that you and your collaborators were doing and the closing down of that space to organize and, and advocate? قبل از اینکه جواب سوال شما رو بدم اجازه بدید که من اول بگم که چرا این کتاب خاطرات هم رو نوشتم. So before responding to your question I first want to say why I wrote this book. همونطوری که شنیدید حکومت رفتار بسیار بدی با من داشت در حالت که میدونست من چون برنده جایزه نوبل هم به بلنگوها و رسانه های زیادی دسترسی دارم. As you heard from Bernadine, the government behaved very badly towards me, whereas they knew that as a Nobel Peace Prize winner, I had access to all the microphones in the world. They still treated me the way they treated me. So just imagine with an unknown a journalist or a young student who is taken into prison, how those people are treated. Now the other reason behind uh, writing this book was to bring confidence to women, specifically young women. من در سن 63 سالگی یعنی سنی که معمولا مردم دیگه فکر میکنن که به بازنشستگی فکر میکنن ظرف یک ماه تمام اموالم را از دست دادم حسابای بانکیم بسته شد همسرم را از دست دادم شغلم را از دست دادم انجیوهای من بستن و من مجبور شدم از کشوری که این همه عاشقش هستم بیرون بیام و در یه جایی سکونت کنم که نه زبونش بلد بودم و نه فرهنگش رو میشناختم. So at age 63 when people usually think about retirement I lost everything that I had built in one month. All of my property was confiscated. I, my bank accounts were closed down. I lost my husband. I lost my career which I really liked. My NGOs, my law office were closed down, and I ended up in a country where I didn't speak the language or knew anything about the culture. اما همه این مسائل باعث نشد که من از پدر بیام و دیگه کار نکنم، بلکه باعث شد که من بیشتر از سابق کار کنم. و بعد بگم خیلی بیشتر از سابق هم موفق شدم. But none of this stopped me from working. I didn't consider any of that as a failure. What I want to say is that I started working more and I succeeded more. پس اجازه بدیم به شما جوانا بگم با شکستی که تو زندگی میخونید از پا در نیاین یک یا دو شکست مثلا در زندگیتون پیش بیاد کارتون از دست بدین یا اینکه با کسی که دوست داشتید نتونستید باهش باشید این شکست ها مهم نیست از هر شکست میتونه مقدمه یک پیروزی برای شما باشه So what I want to tell the young people is that don't be scared of failure for example if you can't uh, continue to be with the person you love or you lose your job or something happens these are not failures that should stop you no these failures can all be an introduction to a larger victory for you Oh, you can see that Dr. Badi didn't answer my question about the repression she faced, um, but really about the continuation of the struggle. Um, so I urge you to read the book to see what it was like to be tracked, openly followed, openly finding all the bugs in your house, in your home, you know, in the wall and in the light fixtures. Find, knowing that your office and your legal work is being scrutinized and, and uh, bugged, followed, watched, uh, and periodically being interrogated and threatened. So I, I will, unless she wants to respond to that, I will refer you to the book uh, and, and uh, of course, agree with her notion that setbacks are not, can't show you what's on the horizon and what's about to happen. 
که ببینید هر چیزی بهایی داره شما وقتی که میخواید پیشتی بگیرید باید حتما چند سال از عمرتون رو تو دانشگاه صرف کنید I think there's a price for everything for example if one wants to do a PhD one has to spend years at the university و دموکراسی و آزادی هم بهایی داره آزادیش هر ملتی که بخواد به دموکراسی برسه باید سیب بهاش رو بده و بهاش همین مشکلاتی است که برای من پیش آوردن که فقط من نبودم برای خیلی های دیگه هست Freedom and democracy have a price to pay too and uh, the freedom that we are uh, after was uh, the price that I paid for that free freedom is what we talked about and it was not only me me and many other people have paid this price for من فکر می کنم پدران شما هم تو آمریکا بهای زیادی واسه آزادیشون دادن اینطور نیست که آمریکا به این راحتی آمریکا شده باشه and i think that your fathers in the united states have paid a big price for their freedom it was not that you just got it فقط مسئله مهم این است که هر کی که به مشکلات بر بخوره حتما از خودش سوال میکنه خب چرا من و چرا مشکلات بس روی من بار بشه but the thing is that whenever we um, hit a hurdle we ask ourselves why me why is it me why should i have all the problems و در این موقع اگر کسی به اون هدفی که انتخاب کرده اعتماد راسخ داشته باشه از سختی ها نمی ترسه مهم نیست که من مالم رو از دست دادم مهم نیست که خانوادم رو از دست دادم مهم این است که هدفم رو گم نکردم هنوزم دو مال اون هدفم But if you truly and really believe in your goal, uh, these failures do not count. For example, it doesn't matter that I have lost all my money. It doesn't matter that I have lost my family. What matters is that I'm still pursuing my goal. Yes. Uh, I want to also say that one of the things in the book is the story of your two remarkable daughters who experienced this surveillance and harassment uh, and who grew up as extraordinary, healthy, independent women with their own lives. What role, I'm going to switch gears a little bit, what role did Mahmoud Ahmadinejad play in Iranian politics? Uh, he became the mayor, he was appointed to be the mayor of Tehran the year that you won the Nobel Peace Prize. And was his continuing, or is his continuing power a factor in the repression of your center and your work and your ability to live in Iran? Tamame mushkilati ke dar kitab until we are free shuma mi khunid bari man pish omad marbut has be zaman Ahmadi Nejad. All of the problems that you're going to read about in my book until uh, we're free uh, were created during the time of Ahmadinejad. Um, قبل از Ahmadinejad هم uh, من مشکلات زیادی داشتم از جمله uh, من زمان خاتمی رفتم زندان. But even prior to Ahmadinejad I had a lot of issues. For example, I was taken to prison during Khatami. و در حقیقت مشکلات حکومت با من از سال 1980 شروع شد یعنی وقتی که اولین قوانین تصویب شد من علیه این قوانین مقاله نوشتم صحبت کردم و از همونجا من داخل در لیست سیاه حکومت بودم این ریالیتی در گورنمنت ستارد چالنجنگ می فرم 1980 It was then that uh, discriminatory laws were passed. I talked about it, I wrote about it, and that's when they started uh, opposing me and hating me. I remember one of the first books that I wrote in the interest of the law and was very So I remember one of the articles that I wrote criticizing one of the laws was... Uh, هنوز uh, سیستم اقتصادی ایران پیریزی نشده بود که چه اقتصادش روی چه قوانینی رو باید حرکت کنه 
قانون گذروندن که یک مرد میتونه چهار تا زن بگیره و من مقاله نوشتم آیا فقط ما انقلاب کرده بودیم که مردمون چهار تا زن بگیرن so it was right after the revolution before the constitution was written before we even knew the basis of our economy and how our economy was to be managed a law passed and the law stated that men can marry four wives and my article was oh so we underwent a revolution so that our men could marry four wives من به همین دلیل من همیشه میگم انقلاب 1979 انقلاب مردان بود علیه زنان برای اینکه از اون به بعد به تدریج قوانین تبعیضامیز بسیار بدی علیه زنان تصویب شد This is why I always say that the uh, revolution of Iran was the revolution of men against women. And uh, the reason behind it is that after that uh, revolution, many, many discriminatory laws against women were passed. I, I'm, I find it irresistible just mentioning to you that there's a chapter about Mahmoud Ahmadinejad um, to not I have to ask you the question, which is, uh, does that writing, which I think you did before the current year in US politics, have resonance in thinking about Donald Trump's role in the US and the world? In Iran, as I said, all of the options در انحصار یک نفره و اون رهبره احمدی نژاد هم فی نفسه خودش قدرتی نداره چون مورد حمایتی به قید و شرط رهبر بود می توانست این همه کارا رو بکنه well as i say, stated earlier in iran all the power remains with the leader the supreme leader احمدی نژاد really didn't have that much power but he was supported by the leader and that's why سیستم سیاسی آمریکا واقعا با ایران تفاوت داره و فکر نمی کنم اگر کسی مثل احمد نژاد رئیس جمهور اینجا باشه باز هم بتونه اون کارا رو بکنه برای اینکه نه به حال یک سیستم به نسبت ایران دموکرات تره the political system in america is very different from iran and i don't think even if someone like ahmed nejad is elected that they can do much the way he did, because I think that it's much more democratic in this country. Uh, I'll let the audience respond to that. Uh, it, of course it is, of course it is. You can't possibly compare it. But I, I want to just point to the demagoguery that allows, uh, it's really the demagoguery, which is not unique to Iran or the United States or Europe or any country in the world. Uh, that allows the demonization of Muslim, all Muslim people, of all Arab people, of all Palestinian people, and so on. من بسیار تعجب می کنم وقتی که این حرف رو از یک کسی که خودش رو سیاست مدار می داند می شنوم. I'm very surprised to hear these words from someone who considers himself or is running for political office. و باید بگم که اگر انتخاب بشه اون موقع حقایق جامعه رو ببینه مسلما این حرفاش عوض بشه and i think if he's elected and he's faced with reality in the society he's not going to pursue these words he's going to change his words الان یه حرفای زده برای اینکه یه دی از این حرفا خوششون بیاد ولی کم طبیعتا خودش هم میدونه اصلا نمیتونه این چنین کاری رو بکنه. I think that he says these things because he thinks that some people may like that, but he knows very well that none of that is going to materialize. He can't do any of that. I hope you're right. Maybe you'll come back. Maybe come back next year. Um, the upheaval in your marriage is one of the most gripping parts of your memoir, of course, and the excerpt that was in the New York Times 10 days ago. So I'm wondering how you came to write about this starkly personal aspect of your life and how the state managed to have him publicly denounce you. 
داستانی که در نیویورک تایمز نوشته بودن بخش کوچکی از این کتاب که من اون رو مخصوصا مطرح کردم برای اینکه عین همین حادثه برای تعدادی از فعالین در ایران اتفاق افتاده بود از جمله چند نفر از موکلین خود من So the uh, excerpt that you see in the New York Times is actually an excerpt of what's written in the book. But the reason that I wrote the story in the book was that it had uh, happened about some other activists who were, uh, some of them were my own clients. Monta, این گونه مسائل در ایران تابوه و کسی راجع بهش حرف نمیزد. و در نتیجه کارهای خلاف اخلاق و خلاف قانون معمولی امنیتی رو کسی نمیدانست من این تابو رو شکستم به بلندترین صدا اعلام کردم که جمهوری اسلامی ایران تعدادی سکس ورکر در استخدام داره برای اینکه مردم رو به تله بیاندازه talking about these issues is a taboo in Iran But I decided to break that taboo, and in a very loud voice, I wrote about it, and I want to say that, unfortunately, the government of the Islamic Republic of Iran has recruited sex workers in order to entrap people. Exactly. So those of you who've read the book know this, um, but it is an incredible story and, and revelation. I have time for one more question. Um, the first American woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize uh, was Jane Addams from Chicago, founder of the world's first juvenile court, founder of the Hague Court for Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Um, you, along with You established the Nobel Women's Initiative in 2006, really at something of a chance meeting with Jody Williams and Wangari Mathai um, uh, in, of Kenya, now including the other women. It seems like such an imaginative and inspired creation. What do you think the roles and possibilities of the Nobel, of the Women's Initiative, Nobel Women's Initiative is? تعداد زنانی که برنده جایزه صلح نوبل شدن بسیار اندکه و این هم یکی دیگه از موارد تبعیض بین زن و مرد برای اینکه زنان لایق زیادی تو دنیا هستن که لیاقت این جایزه رو دارن the women who the number of the women who have won the Nobel Peace Prize is a fewer than men And I think this is another discriminatory issue because there are many meritorious women working in our world who deserve the Nobel Peace Prize. In the year 2004, in the case of the Nobel Peace Prize, the women who had this prize, and at that time, we were only seven women in Nairobi, in a conference on the mines of the land. So uh, in 2004, uh, three of the seven women who have won the Nobel Peace Prize and are living were in Nairobi together. There was a conference on uh, removing landmines. We were only, there was only seven alive at that time. Man be judi va matay pishnaat kardam bian همه با هم همکاری کنیم و از نور افکنی که روی هر کدام از ما استفاده کنیم برای اینکه بتوانیم به سایر زنان در سراسر جهان کمک کنیم. So I suggested to Jody, I said, uh, you know, and Matai, and I said, you know, there's a spotlight on us, so let's get together and let's use our celebrity in order to help women in the world. خوشبختانه اونا قبول کردن و در با بقیه زنا صحبت کردیم بقیه هم قبول کردن و در سال 2006 این کنفرانس NWI 
Women Nobel Initiative در کانادا رسما تأسیس شد دفتر ما تو کانادا است. Yes, so fortunately the others agreed as well and so we all joined together and we formed the Nobel Women's Initiative our offices in Canada. متأسفانه ونگاری متای چند سال بعد فوت کرد و ما از دستش دادیم اما از اون طرف سه زن دیگر برنده جایزه نوبل شدن که به ما اضافه شدن. Uh, unfortunately, Wangari Mathai died a few years later and we lost her, but three other women won the Nobel Peace Prize and they joined us. Uh -huh. um, as, as you can tell, Ms. Dr. Badi has a wicked sense of humor along with everything else. And she quotes in her book that when she won the Nobel Peace Prize, the governing authorities, I can't remember who it was now, said, Oh, the Peace Nobel Peace Prize is nothing. It's the Nobel Prize in literature that really matters. <laughs> that was a great. Um, now we have time for some questions from the audience. So make your question pointed and brief, please. Uh, you said 60% of the college students are women. Are there jobs available for them when they leave college? And, or are they expected to be married right away? Uh, زنان ما در مشاغل مختلف اجتماعی هستند. Yes, our women are present in the social different uh, social positions. اما متاسفانه در پیدا کردن شغل مردها مقدمند و درصد بیکاری در زنها سه برابر بیش از مرد است. Uh, but unfortunately, finding a job is much uh, more difficult for women. They are behind men in finding a job, and the uh, rate of unemployment is three times as much as many for women in Iran. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for coming here today. It's such an honor to see you speak. And my question is, what is one piece of advice um, you have for young women like me? من توصیه‌ام رو قبلا گفتم با اون این است که اعتماد به نفس داشته باشید از شکستم نترسید. I said it earlier I said have confidence and don't be scared of failure. Uh, thank you Mr. Zabadi for an excellent book. I wish you'd say that the book was very depressing for a great civilization it's really hard to see what's happened to the Iranian people. The Persians have such contribution to art, literature, and everything. So where do you think we go from here? And what is the status of the arts in Iran right now? What is happening to the authors, the poets, and everybody else? Ayande Iran musallaman behtar az emruz khohat bud. Zira ke Iran potansiyel hai khubi baray taqir musbat dare. Uh, certainly, the future of Iran is going to be better than today because there are many potentials for a positive um, change in Iran. Uh, we have a very strong student movement and uh, uh, they are very sensitive when it comes to social and political issues. However, unfortunately, a number of them are in prison now, and that's the reason that they are interested in politics. feminist <coughs> اجازه بدید من از یکی از اونا نام ببرم نقدس محمدی. And the feminist movement is very strong in Iran. However, a number of them are in prison. We have a hundred feminists in prison now, and I want to name one of them, Miss Nargis Mohammadi. اما نکته جالب اینه که نرگس با وجود که به شش سال حبس محکوم شده و در زندانه، اما تو همین زندان هم. یک کمپینی به راه انداخت کمپین حمایت از مادران زندانی و این کمپین به شدت فعال برای اینکه کمک کنه برای تأسیس مهد کودک در جوار زندان ها 
So uh, what's unique about this woman, Ms. Nargis Mohammadi, is that she has received six years of imprisonment. However, in prison, she has come up with this campaign, which is the campaign for the support of mothers who are in prison. And she's working very hard to see if uh, they could establish a daycare for mothers who are in prison, for their children. یعنی می‌بینید حتی دیوارهای زندان هم نمی‌تواند صدای زنان ما رو خاموش کنه. So as you can see, not even the walls of prison can silence our women's voices. ما جنبش کارگری خیلی خوبی داریم. Also, we have a very good uh, employee uh, or workers uh, movement. دانش و تکنولوژی خیلی خوبی در ایران است. Knowledge and technology are at a high level in Iran. ایران کشور ثروتمندی معادن غنی داره. Iran is a very wealthy country and it has a very rich mines in it. ما دومین ذخیره گاز جهان را داریم. And we also have the second largest gas reserves in the world. و با این همه پتانسیل های و اینها تمام پتانسیل های خیلی خوبی است برای تغییر مثبت در آینده ایران. And these are all uh, good potentials for positive change in Iran in the future. I'm going to ask again for the second part of the gentleman's question, which was specifically about the arts and humor. Uh, uh, arts have improved uh, in some subjects in Iran after the revolution. As Jomle Cinema Iran, Bada Zangalob, Heli Hubtaraz, Gabra Zangalob. For example, the cinema in Iran has improved uh, much more and is much better than the cinema prior to the revolution. Shoyat Yiki has the Lorish in Butke, a Vurud film Hoy Horejiro, Beiran Kadagan Kadabuda. Maybe it's because uh, the uh, foreign films couldn't come to Iran. Also, we have very good writers and poets. Of course, in Iran, censorship is very strong. And any book that is going to be published needs a special permit from the government. اما همین سانسور باعث یک خلاقیتی در نویسندگان ما شده که طوری حرف میزنن که مردم میفهمن سانسور چی نمیفهمه. But the same thing, censorship has resulted in our writers writing in a way that people understand, but the people in charge of censorship do not. و این مسئله ای است که در تاریخ ایران قدمت بسیاری داره شما دیوان حافظ رو نگاه کنید ببینید از یک شعر چند معنا میتونید از سوش در بیارید این آیا غیر از اینه که ایران همیشه با سانسور و سرکوب بوده But this has a history in Iran if we look at the poetry of Hafez the well known Iranian poet we will see that you can interpret his poetry in many different ways this proves that in Iran we've always had censorship. Of course, uh, this is not true about music because some of these people uh, think that uh, music should be banned. And so music has not have that kind of progress. خواندن زن در ایران ممنوعه و متاسفانه خوانندگان زن ما رو اجازه پخش آثارشون آثارشون رو نمیدن. Also solo singing for women is prohibited in Iran and so uh, there are many women who are very able and uh, sing well but uh, they cannot be heard. As a young Muslim woman, I'd like to know how you think the Western feminist movement of the 21st century has impacted um, specifically Muslim women in the Middle East, and do you think that this has been a positive impact? 
در درجه اول من میخوام این سوال رو بکنم که چرا هر چیز خوب رو شما به غرب نسبت میدید؟ First I want to ask you, you a question why is it that you think everything good goes back to the west مثلا میگیم مثلا میگیم فمینیسم غربی یا دموکراسی غربی For example we talk about western feminism or western democracy و با این ترتیب در حقیقت قبول میکنیم که مسلمان ها نمیتونن فمینیست باشن So we accept in a way that Muslims cannot be feminists یا اینکه مسلمان ها جامعه دموکرات نمیتونه داشته باشن or that muslims cannot have a democratic society البته در اینکه زنان غرب پیشگام برای مبارزه جهت تساوی حقوق بودن بحثی نیست of course i don't argue the fact that women in the west have been pioneers fighting for women's rights و این در حقیقت یکی از عواقب و نتایج رنسانس and it is actually a result of the renaissance اما فمینیسم یک معنای واحد داره به معنای برابری حقوق زن و مرد but feminism has one meaning and that means equal rights for women and women و زنان مسلمان می توانند فمینیست باشند so muslim women can be feminists و اون تفسیری از اسلام ارائه بدند که برابری حقوق رو تضمین بکنه and they should come up with interpretations of islam that guarantees equal rights من نمیدونم آیا وقت دارم که راجع به این مسئله بیشتر صحبت کنم یا اینکه وقت تمومه do i have time to elaborate on that or don't yes. مسلمانان مدرن معتقدند که قوانین شریعت دو دست است. Modern Muslims believe that Sharia laws are divided into two categories. یک دست قوانینی که روابط ما رو با خدا تنظیم می‌کنه مثل عبادت روز اینا. The first category is those laws that pertain to our relationship with God, like praying, like fasting. این قوانین غیر قابل تغییر هستند یعنی تا زمانی که کسی خودش رو مسلمان میدونه همونطوری باید نماز بخونه you can change these laws because if one of the things of himself or herself as a muslim then that person has to observe those laws اما این قوانین شخصیه و هیچ حکومت یا دسته‌ای حق نداره <تصفح> کسی رو به خاطر عدم رعایت این قوانین تنبیه بکنه مثلا اینه که در ایران کسی روزه روزه نمیگیره مجازات میشه این کاملا غیر شرعیه uh, but these laws are personal laws and no government has the right to interrogate anyone for not observing them for example in iran if people don't fast they will be uh, punished but this is not acceptable at all دسته دوم قوانین شریعت اونایی هستن که روابط افراد رو در اجتماع تنظیم میکنن مثل قوانین خانواده مثل مجازات ها But the second category of Sharia laws are laws that pertain to the relationship of people in the society like family laws like the criminal law این قوانین بایستی بر حسب یعنی با حفظ روح قانون بر حسب زمان و مکان while we keep the spirit of the law but these laws have to be changed according to time and place for example in the Quran we read that the hand of the thief should be cut off in قانون شریعت یک روح داره که اون روحش این است که دوزی بده و دوز باید مجازات شود. Now the spirit of this Sharia law is that uh, theft is not acceptable and a thief should be punished. این روح بایستی حفظ بشه. So we have to keep the spirit of the law. اما اینکه مجازات چه باشد این بستگی داره به زمانی که و مکانی که مجازات اعمال میشه. But what the punishment should be should be compatible to the time and place. Uh, that the punishment is being carried out. 
در چهارده قرن قبل دوزدار اینجوری مجازات میکردن چنان که اون موقع تو اروپا اساسا دوزدار آتیش میزدن 14 centuries ago that's how they punished thieves for example in Europe they set fire uh, to, uh, and they would uh, put the thieves in fire اما الان زندان هست میشه باید زندان شد but now we have prisons we put them in prisons حالا پنجاه سال بعد ممکنه زندان هم غیر عادلانه باشه برای اینکه یه مجازات های بهتر و انسانی تر دیگری بیاد. So 50 years from now we may even not want prison. We may think that there are more humanitarian punishments and we may change that. قوانینی که مربوط به برابری زن و مرد هم هست هم به همین صورته. So the laws pertaining to equal rights for men and women are the same. مثال ارث زن نصف ارث مرد for example the inheritance what a woman inherits is half of that of a man اون موقع زن ها مولد ثروت نبودند ثروت خانواده در اثر کار مردها و پسرها ایجاد میشد بنابراین خیلی طبیعی بود که موقع ارث به زن کمتر بده so at that time women were not wealth producers in the family It was the work of men and the sons that created the wealth of the family. So it might have seemed um, natural and reasonable to give girls half of that of the men. Uh, but now it's not only one person who produces wealth or, uh, in the family, women have a role in that too. So women should be uh, inheriting the same as men. This is how we can be both a Muslim and believe in the equal rights of women and men. Dr. Batty. <laughs>